Let me start by thanking Madig for this kind invitation, and I'm really honored to be here, since uh, also it's the first time that I play as a presenter for the Aswan Air Center. It's really an honor. Well, <coughs> after a lot uh, of uh, randomized controlled trial comparing thimerolysis with PCI, uh, after 20 years of a great debate about uh, the right strategy for the treatment of acute myocardial infarction, it was very clear finally in 2003 by a meta analysis by Cindy Grimes that uh, primary PCI as compared to thrinolysis uh, provide a strong benefit in terms of death or infarction, recurrent ischemia, stroke, and of course of the composite of these very hardened points. And this was true not only for the short-term follow-up, but also in long-term follow-up with the maintaining benefit in death, reinfarction, and recurrent ischemia. <coughs> it was also very clear in 2006 that uh, there is a, a PCI-related delay that may decrease the benefit of primary PCI. And uh, this delay in many papers was approximately in two hours of PCI-related delay. Over this delay, uh, fibrinolysis uh, did better than primary PCI, while the strong benefit with PCI was just seen with PCI-related delay of less than two hours. But it's more important to consider in delay to treatment uh, not only the PCI-related delay, but also the delay from symptom onset to treatment. And uh, this, in my view, is the right uh, uh, assessment of the effect of the impact of delay on myocardial salvage. And this is uh, a study by De Luca from the Zwolf Center showing that uh, there is a more than linear relationship between the delay from symptom onset to treatment and mortality. Again, for many years, uh, attention focused on the delay uh, called door to balloon time, the delay from admission to the hospital and the first balloon inflection. And it was clear from many studies that also there was a relationship between mortality and uh, the <coughs> length of this delay with the, lower mo the lowest mortality for daughter Valentine less than 90 minutes and a progressive increase in mortality with increase in this delay. Again, this is data from uh, the National Registry of Myocardial Infarction that means <coughs> uh, hundreds of thousands of patients with acute myocardial infarction in the United States. And again, you can see that the PCI-related less than <coughs> two hours is associated with a strong benefit in terms of survival as compared to fibrinolysis, while with the door to balloon time of more than two hours is <coughs> associated with no benefit or a negative comparison with fibrinolysis. I think that uh, this door to balloon time should not be more considered in 2013 because this is a very arbitrary delay. Uh, because uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction doesn't start at the door of the hospital, of course, it doesn't end with the balloon. It's too much simplistic uh, since uh, are not considered in this time. Uh, patients who are invisible because are transferred from other hospitals, and this was a delay. And also for patients who are in very critical situation, also in intra-hospital transfer to the cat lab may be delayed for this, and these patients have a very high mortality rate. <coughs> However, drug to balloon time, in my view, is a very good indicator of the quality of the procedure, because a very short drug to balloon time in this hospital with a facility for primary PCI that is very short means that all logistic constraints are overcame, and more importantly, this uh, is generally associated with a very good skill of the operators. Uh, in support of this view is more recent works showing that in, for example, in the region of Michigan, United States, in a study including approximately 
9,000 patients. There was a strong, impressive decrease of door to balloon time from 2003 to 2008, but this was not associated with a significant decrease in mortality. Because already in 2003, this uh, hospital provided a very high quality of the procedure. What about the inter-hospital delay in transfer patients? Here, the relationship between mortality and the length of delay is less clear. Obviously, with a very short delay in transfer from uh, one hospital without PCI facility to the PCI center is very low, 3.2%. Then we have a stable increase of six, uh, approximately 6% 6 of mortality rate for a delay between 30 and 90 minutes and any increase uh, for a delay of more than 90 minutes. But uh, in this bar, we have to consider all patients were objective difficulty in transfer because of cardiogenic shock or pulmonary edema may really explain the long delay, more than the distance of the hospital without facility to the <coughs> primary PCI center. Thus, I think that in summary, we have learned uh, several le lessons the early the presentation, the greater the myocardial salvage. Infant duration, time to reperfusion is highly correlated with survival, and effective reperfusion is the primary goal of uh, primary PCI. It's very important that effective reperfusion means not only the opening of the infant uh, artery vessel, but also an effective reperfusion at the level of the microvessel network, since this is very important to achieve a salvage of myocardium, and this may be clearly and very easily seen by the trend of a CT segment elevation resolution and also by several angiographic markers of reperfusion, such as TIMI grade flu or more important uh, TIMI blush grade. What about uh, the setting up of the primary PCI service? It is important to outline that uh, there are two components. One is the procedure of primary PCI and one the process that uh, uh, is related to the <coughs> PCI center. The procedure is generally inexperienced and very easily. It's a simple procedure in the majority of cases, but uh, there are at least 20% of patients where skills of the operator is of paramount importance. Uh, in complex cases, since primary PCI failure in this setting is associated with a very high mortality rate, higher than the spontaneous mortality rate. And uh, the setting includes patients with very complex coronary anatomy, uh, very complex peripheral vascular access, and uh, clinical conditions such as frailty, cardiogenic shock, renal failure, bleeding risk. In this subset of patients, approximately 20% of patients, the skill of the invasive cardiology team is of paramount importance. However, the PCI service is a complex and a difficult process and has enormous regional variation and is ugly constrained by costs and resources of personnel and labs. Currently, there are two models for uh, setting up a primary PCI service, pre-hospital triage and activation by physician who are in a very well-equipped ambulance that is a STEM center, bypassing the emergency room of the hospital with PCI facility. And this model allows a dotted balloon time of less than 90 minutes in more than 80% of cases. The other model is transmission, wireless transmission to the hospital with PCI facility of the electrocardiogram, pre-hospital alert, emergency room medical management, and then the cat lab. These two models are really not too much effective when you consider the cost of this model and the efficacy. And uh, also in an old paper, of 2007, it was seen that uh, uh, with this model there is a very high percentage of uh, false positive cardiac catheterization and geography because of inappropriate activation of the emergency service complex. But the more recent works, this is circulation 2012, 
show that uh, in a regional network, including thousands of patients, inappropriate activation of the system is uh, present very frequently. One patient out of four uh, result in inappropriate activation of the emergency service. And I think that it's very difficult to decrease this percentage because it's more easy to make an in, in, uh, inappropriate coronary angiography for uh, ambiguous electrocardiogram or ambiguous clinical symptom than to deny reperfusion in patients who need reperfusion because it's true myocardial infarction. Just a few words to explain why in, se in some cases it is possible that the primary PCI service is supported by fortuitous of this uh, region. This is the case, for example, in Florence, uh, a very <coughs> long experience of more than 25 years. The fortuitous for a primary PCI service in Florence uh, had two components. The first is the pioneering work of Geoffrey Arzler in the 70s, and this is portrait of this really fantastic man, who was the first to make uh, uh, angioplasty without stent, without to be three inhibitors in the setting of acute myocardial infarction and showed very clear that not only was safe and feasible, but was associated, but without randomized studies, with a very <coughs> strong improvement in survival. And in Florence, I was immediately convinced of the ideas of Jeffrey Arzer. The other component of the fortuitous primary PCI service in Florence was the availability from uh, some years of a mobile coronary care unit that uh, was, uh, and this service was uh, um, installed in Florence uh, with the goal to treat uh, out hospital uh, arrest. And uh, in this ambulance, there were physicians who were fellow of the School of Cardiology. That's, according to my enthusiasm, this physician called directly me. I took my uh, motorbike, and with the motorbike, I, I called for the nurse at the home, and then I went to the cat lab. Generally, uh, 15 minutes before the arrival of the patients directly from home. And in this fantastic model, the door to balloon time was zero for all patients. And also, this was really a very cheap model. What about the uh, situation in Egypt? Well, first of all, we have to consider that uh, there are very important variations in the regions of Egypt. This is Cairo and this is Aswan. And I think that uh, though we need different models for these two realities. But again, uh, as in Florence, uh, we have a fortuitous element, that is the presence of a very important hospital in Aswan, the Aswan Health Center, and this was not planned by the regional government or the national government, but was the result of the vision of Magdi Yacoub. Thus we start with this hospital. And we focused more on the invasive cardiology team, because the cardiology team was already available. Thus, the first goal was the formation of a skilled invasive cardiology team. And we estimated also a very high percentage of a late percent of MI, and an estimated door to balloon time of 30 minutes. For the future, as will be shown by Dr. Amr, uh, we think that uh, it will be possible, perhaps, the formation of a regional network for interhospital transfer, and also, as in Western country, pre-hospital electrocardiogram and the notification, triage, etc. I will focus just uh, uh, with a few slides uh, for the effect of a PCI in late presenter. The value of reperfusion diminishes after 12 hours no doubt. And the characteristics associated with late presentation include advanced age and the lower socioeconomic status. And this means that uh, the uh, patients who are uh, elderly patients uh, had the, more, uh, the worst uh, risk profile 
and this is associated also with late presentation. In this setting, the mortality rate and the complications, not only of the infarction, but also of the procedure are higher, and the PCI is more challenging because of the high rate of no reflow, the difficult in a removal of organized thrombus, and also the increased risk of bleeding. We assessed in uh, 2005 the effect of <coughs> PCI, routine PCI, in late percent, uh, more than 12 hours, patients who were also asymptomatic without evidence of ongoing ischemia or cardiogenic shock, and these patients were randomized to a routine invasive treatment or routine medical care, and the primary endpoint was the final infarcide as assessed by scintigraphy. Well, these are the results regarding the primary endpoint. The, the final infarcide was 13% in the conservative arm and 8% in the invasive arm. And in my view, it was more important that despite the fact that the study was not power powered for clinical endpoint, there was a divergence in the survival curve that was more amplified after one year until three years. A sub-study that included patients with pair scintigraphy at baseline at one week from randomization showed that the two arms were well balanced in terms of the extension of area to risk and at one week, patient randomized to PCI had an 8% of final infarct size versus 12% of the conservative arm, with a salvage index that was nearly doubled as compared to the conservative arm. And this is the link that may explain the smaller infarct size at one week. In support of this study, uh, there is also a meta-analysis of of randomized trial uh, comparing conservative therapy or routine invasive therapy for late percenter, and also this meta analysis showed a significant decrease in mortality for patients who receive routine therapy. Thus, also if we have, uh, and we predict to have, in us one, a high percentage of late percenter, I think that we will apply it according to the result of this study uh, routine invasive management. Because we have to consider that also for late percenter there is the possibility of uh, <coughs> significant myocardial salvage. This is the situation in uh, 2005 in the United States. Uh, after many years uh, there is a really a very short time from symptom onset to admission and uh, this is, is uh, an average value <laughs> Uh, of only 60 minutes of door to balloon time. And uh, the strong benefit, the strongest benefit of primary PCI is obviously in the first three hours. And after three hours, the myocardial service is decreased, but not in this form, since there are several factors that include the collateral flow, ischemic preconditioning, uh, oxygen consumption, for example, patients who are on uh, chronic beta blocker therapy, who may uh, change this curve and uh, may explain also a late myocardial salvage after three hours. And uh, this is too, also considering the data, again, of the five registry of national uh, registry of myocardial infarctions in the United States, uh, that show that uh, initially, in the 90s, there was an increase in the mortality uh, for uh, tra patients transferred from uh, hospital without PCI facility to primary PCI hospital. But uh, during the years, uh, with the same delay in transfer, there was the same mortality. This means that uh, there was an improved quality of a procedure that overcame the delay due to the transfer. And according also to the more recent guidelines, uh, you see that uh, nearly all patients uh, have indication one or two A or B for a, a routine invasive treatment. Obviously, patients uh, admitted within 12 hours uh, or with severe heart failure or cardiogenic shock or with contraindication to fibrinolysis and the clinical and electrocardiographic evidence of uh, ongoing ischemia 
and also asymptomatic patients presenting between 12 and 24 hours after symptom onset at a high risk of, uh, uh, <coughs> of heart failure. But again, there is a two class recommendation for the LIED or elective PCI uh, if there is clinical evidence of uh, fibrinolytic failure or if there is also a patent infant artery between 3 and 4, uh, 24 hours from fibrinolysis or ischemia or non-invasive testing or hemodynamically significant stenosis in a patient in a patent infant artery more than 24 hours uh, from symptom onset. Thus, in all these cases, that means 90% uh, of patients with acute myocardial infarction, uh, there is indication for routine invasive treatment, and this is also supported by this strategy. Uh, in this new class uh, of patients, uh, who have a, a, if, you have a, if you transfer the patient from an hospital without uh, without a PCI facility to an hospital with a PCI center, 3 to 24 hours after fibrolytic treatment, if uh, uh, the intent is to perform PCI, it is reasonable uh, to perform this, and uh, uh, whatever the result of fibrolysis, successful or unsuccessful, because so you know that uh, after successful fibrinolysis there is a very high recurrence of occlusion and recurrent myocardial infarction. Thus, in conclusion, uh, the effectiveness of a primary PCI is time dependent and best results are seen with the lowest symptom onset to treatment. However, elderly and complicated MI have a greater magnitude of benefit with primary PCI also with uh, long delay and a skilled center that maximizes the effectiveness of reperfusion strongly enhances the result. And the transferred patient, the late presentation patient, also benefit from primary PCI. This, I think, is very important, the last conclusion, since in regions with the limited resources, such as the region of ASWA, a primary PCI service should focus more on the formation of a quality invasive cardiology team than an expensive and unlikely regional ambulance network allowing pre-hospital triage and the protected transfer to the Army Center. This is the so-called realistic approach. Thank you for your attention. So, Dr. Antonucci, for a patient, for a STEMI patient presented to a, PC, uh, a hospital without PCI facility, and we are expecting a total uh, door to balloon, door from the Ferris Hospital to Balloon Hospital that, it that will exceed the 120 minutes. Are you going to still recommend uh, primary PCI for these patients or going directly to fibrinolysis? Yes, the, the, the former, because. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the problem of transfer is, in my, in, in my view, n not been understood, see, not well understood since, uh, for example, you have to consider that uh, one third of patients who are admitted in the hospital with a diagnosis of acute MI are self-referral in the hospital by own car. And uh, the transfer for another hospital, maybe also, of uh, two or three hours, but uh, if it's superior to this, I suggest that uh, the patients uh, and his relative, of course, take the car and uh, go to the hospital with primary PCI facility, since also uh, I think that there is an increased risk in delay over three or four hours because of the lack of an ambulance service. Uh, and the transfer, it is clear, sure, that is not so dangerous. Uh, also, an unprotected transfer with a protected transfer, the, the risk of uh, ventricular fibrillation is less than 1%. While there is to die, uh, waiting for uh, six or seven hours for an ambulance that is not well equipped, I think that is superior. Thus, I suggest holes to perform routinely in invasive therapy, according also to the two <coughs> class two recommendation of the new guideline of 2011 for routine treatment of these patients. More questions? Dr. Sophie, Professor Sophie. Sometimes it's difficult to, to understand what is the, is it the, the patient, we understand the doctor friend at home, 
or the first medical contact when you come to the hospital. So when you define the first medical contact, this is my first, uh, I mean, half question. The second that in the guidelines said that if the patient hemodynamically stable after 24 hours, if you have a total occlusion, LAD or, uh, or any, any artery, this harmful to do a PCR for this patient. So why you do angiogram for this uh, patient to say that it's totally occluded in spite of the fact this patient is stable? This is the reason, because uh, this recommendation, three, a class three recommendation, is the result of the odd trial. But uh, this trial is really not uh, an evidence-based medicine, but uh, it's a surrealistic trial since uh, I participated in this trial enrolling one patient in six years. And uh, you know the enrollment rate was very long. And uh, generally, these patients are very, lo very, very low risk patients. This was the difficulty in enrollment. Because if you have an aborted anterior myocardial infarction, patients are symptomatic, uh, also with the total occlusion of the vessel, it benefits of uh, an invasive treatment. Obviously, if you have a very low risk patients, I think that uh, also aspirin is not uh, strongly indicated for this because it increases the risk of uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. But uh, this uh, recommendation is due to the result of the OR trial. Uh, regarding the first medical contact, by definition, the first medical contact is the first contact with a physician. This may be uh, the personal physician, the physician of the ambulance, uh, or the physician of the hospital. And it's very difficult uh, to assess the true delay to treatment uh, from symptom onset uh, according to the definition of the first medical contact. One more question, Professor Gendi. That's getting the patient to a hospital where PCI is being done after giving him thrombolytic therapy within three to 24 hours, which is a successful strategy. Why it's radically different from facilitated PCI, which has been negated by so many studies, including the finesse stu study, although it's the same, the difference is just a delay for three hours. Is that because of the extra bleeding or you have a different pathophysiologic explanation for the radical difference between facilitated and uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy. Yes, I don't deny the value of facilitated PCI, despite the fact that, as you know, there is not evidence that is beneficial. However, uh, if you have a very, very early presentation in a hospital without PCI facility, I think that is strongly recommended a fibrinolytic treatment, according also to the risk for bleeding. Yes, you know, in the last year it is very clear demonstrated that uh, a major bleeding uh, has a strong impact on outcome. But however, also if you have uh, an effective, and this was shown by the study of Carlo Di Mario, also if you have an, eff an effective uh, reperfusion with fibrinolytic, uh, there is a benefit uh, of a routine invasive treatment because the high risk of recurrence. And the recurrence after fibrinolysis is really a dramatic event. You have to consider that in the GASTO-1 study, more than 40,000 patients, 37% of death, nearly half of death, were due to recurrent myocardial infarction. This is the reason why, one of the reasons why, routine invasive treatment after fibrinolysis that seems to be effective has strong benefit, has a strong benefit.